Welcome to today's webinar on IR detectors and sync and trigger. Uh, my name is Desmond Lamont. I'm a director for the Teledyne FLIR Research and Science Vertical. Uh, before we go ahead and get started, just want to do a little housekeeping here. Uh, you can enter questions through the webinar portal uh, that you see on your side, uh, your screen there in the ribbon. Uh, I will try to answer these as time permits. Um, but if there are some questions that end up afterwards uh, that, that linger there uh, after we run out of time, uh, we'll capture those. So uh, eventually you will get an answer to the question, even if not during the exact webinar. So to provide context uh, with the agenda here, first, you know, I'm going to briefly review our detector types. We do this in the previous videos. Uh, I'm going to do an abbreviated version here, and then we'll dive deeper on the topic of sync and trigger. Uh, in the webinar, uh, we're going to get aligned on terminology, how to approach the, how the approach to the actual differences in detector design uh, affects triggering and syncing capabilities, and then do a brief wrap up with how it plays into typical thermal or infrared applications. Just as a reminder, again, this is one of a five-part webinar uh, series covering the five things you need to know about IR detectors for research applications. Uh, all sessions are going to be recorded and available for on-demand viewing on our website, and anyone that registered for the webinar will receive a link to the video once it posts. Uh, currently, sessions one through three covering the topics of speed, sensitivity, and spatial resolution uh, are available. So feel free to check those out on the website, share them with colleagues that may have an interest uh, and learning more about IR detectors, uh, specifically for research and science. So moving on to the different detector type review. Uh, so just briefly before diving into the actual detectors, let's talk about the electromagn electromagnetic spectrum and where we fit. Uh, most of you, you're very familiar with the visible spectrum. Uh, it runs at a few hundred nanometer wavelengths, three or 400 or so, up to about 900 nanometers uh, in length. Our cameras are going to operate in the infrared spectrum located at wavelengths longer than the visible spectrum. Um, at FLIR, that's going to begin at around one micron wavelength uh, with, you know, we consider true thermal bands beginning at about three micron. Uh, at the shortest wavelength that you see here, um, uh, we're going to be talking about SWIR, and that's shortwave infrared. That's located closest to the visible spectrum. So SWIR isn't only good for seeing through materials like glass, but it's also useful for visibility through haze, seeing through layers of paint for non-destructive tests or non-destructive engineering, those sorts of things, um, because it can uh, manipulate the uh, or take advantage of the same effects that we see as uh, with visible light. So we can see through materials like glass, you know, uh, plexi, that kind of thing. As you move further and further into longer waves, those materials become opaque. So SWIR allows us to, to take advantage of those. Next, you're going to see mid-wave IR. Uh, this is typically going to be three to five micron, and that's the standard range when it comes to most radiometry and more challenging thermography applications. Uh, the detectors that address mid-wave, they're exceptionally sensitive, uh, typically better than 20 millikelvin NEDT. Uh, if you're not familiar with sensitivity, uh, go ahead and watch the video on that. That dives deep into it. Um, and for many applications when it comes to, to mid-wave, there's enough energy to adequately fill detector wells to run at very high frame rates here as well. Um, finally, we've got long-wave IR, which typically begins at about 7.5 to 8 micron uh, and goes out to about 12 or 14 micron, depending on the detector. Uh, there are a few different detector technologies that address long wave. Uh, in the long wave, there are a lot of photons, so it becomes easier to conduct measurements of colder temperature targets. Um, it also enables the use of silicon-based detectors called bolometers, which we'll talk about here in a minute. And it allows for cryocooled options that are going to achieve very short integration times in comparison to their mid-wave counterparts I just mentioned, uh, specifically at more ambient temperatures. Uh, at the end of the day, though, all IR wave bands are going to be complementary to each other uh, for the unique capabilities or properties found in each range of the spectrum that they cover and the inherent capabilities of the, the specific detector uh, design and material. So when it comes to the specific hardware, the left side of the chart here, it's going to show common examples of microbolometer based systems. These range from very small sensors like that in the bottom left that you see, that's our lepton uh, detector. Uh, to the more common handheld cameras in the center of the slide used by a lot of people for quick evaluation of a circuit, motor, pump, you know, other relatively larger, slower targets. Uh, above those, 
uh, you're going to see the above the handhelds that is you're going to see the fixed mount version of the same kind of detector it's just a different form fa factor to address different types of applications uh, on the right side of the screen are going to be examples of cryo-cooled cameras these are also called photon counters or quantum detectors. Uh, these systems are much higher performance and are typically the models of choice for engineers and scientists due to the flexibility, high speeds, incredible sensitivity, and access to the raw data. So you can not only get access to the raw data, but you can leverage that for custom user calibrations to really optimize the system for your, your unique capture. Now, I mentioned the two different detector types of bolometer and cryocooled. There are actually quite a few detector materials available for the cryocooled detector that you're going to see here. Uh, these range from indium antimonide, which is INSBI, uh, to Mercad telluride, MCT, to strain layer super lattice uh, type 2, which is SLS, and so on. Um, the good news is that by best detector performance and broad application use over the years, the market's effectively standardized on the use of ingas or indium gallium arsenide for SWIR, INSBI for midwave, and bolometers for most long wave infrared applications. Uh, some, some of you may have heard of hot midwave IR. Um, there's been a lot more uh, of a recent push towards hot midwave across the industry. Um, and that includes, when I say the industry, that includes a lot of surveillance applications and, and that kind of thing. Uh, and the thing to know about this is that HOT, it's actually an acronym for high operating temperature. It doesn't necessarily mean HOT. And what I mean by that is that we're talking about cryo-cooled detectors. So these are going to use, you know, that newer SLS material for the focal plane array. And HOT just means, or higher operating temperature, just means that, you know, instead of cooling that detector down to 70 or 80, you know, Kelvin, um, the detector only, you know, only cools down to say 100, kel uh, 100 Kelvin. So that's still very cold. I mean, we're talking about negative 173 degrees Celsius. So still very cold, just higher than it, than it was before. And that's for, you know, longer, cooler life and things of that nature. But at any rate, specifically with respect to science and research, you know, applications, we haven't found the performance of the SLS material to be better or, or close enough even to the INSBI material in terms of sensitivity, operability, production yields. So read that as the cost is still very high for those, those focal plane arrays. So while the SLS cameras, you know, we do have SLS cameras to address, you know, uh, cooled long wave options. So having the benefits of a cool detector, but addressing that long wave option, you know, we do still have those for that area. We don't see it immediately replacing our mid wave, you know, line right now. The leverage is NSB. Uh, I will say that whether in long wave or in any wave band, choosing the right detector will really depend on your specific application requirements and having even basic knowledge about the differences between the primary detector types on the market is really going to assist you in identifying the most appropriate option for your specific application. But as always, I'd recommend uh, reaching out and speaking with your local sales engineer to identify the final configuration options because there might be a, a snake in the wood pile, if you will. So let's talk about sync and trigger, starting with the terminology. So the word trigger, uh, it's commonly used to describe, you know, a method or mechanism that begins a data capture, you know, typically based on an event that meets some threshold or criterion, you know, it's something that initiates a recording, right? Uh, depending on the exact use of the term, it could be something more deterministic, like the rising edge of a 5-volt TTL signal, uh, or it could be the equivalent of just pressing a record button. All depends on who's saying it and what they mean. So that's why alignment here is very important. Uh, in the next slide, we're going to dive more into the exact definitions, but for those that have absolutely no experience with triggering an event, let's, uh, let's cover just a very simple uh, example here. So let's say that we're interested in a very fast event. You know, for this example, uh, let's say that we want to see how efficient and innovative new fuel sources distributed, consumed, and exited from a vehicle's engine, from a piston chamber. Uh, while there are a lot of other aspects, uh, tests like that's going to have to consider, short of exactly how to view the inside of the piston chamber, um, the event is very fast, and we might only get one chance at the capture before that window is ruined or something else happens, like the engine fails. I mean, we're innovating here, right? So anything can happen. Um, this is where a trigger of some kind comes into play. We need to kick off the recording of the event, possibly in sync or in conjunction with other data acquisition and test instrumentation, 
And since this is a very fast event, someone pressing the record button just isn't going to work. Uh, as you can see, we've got our test vehicle on the right, um, our other test instrumentation on the left-hand side, and our camera right in the middle. Uh, in this very simplified cartoon, uh, we'd likely have a connection to the test vehicle from our uh, test instrumentation control station uh, to initiate the starting of the vehicle and read whatever signal it is that we plan to use to tell our control station that it's time to record, effectively kicking off that trigger. So we'd have a connection then running from that control station over to our uh, camera. Let's say that it's going to provide a three to five volt TTL uh, as, as prescribed by the camera here. Now, when our threshold condition has been satisfied, our system, it's going to send the trigger, you know, to the camera and uh, the other data acquisition devices to begin the recording. And ideally, everything has been set up appropriately and we successfully capture the image of our fuel burn as you see here. So that's, that's just a very simplified description for someone who's never actually been uh, exposed to this kind of thing. So now we have a basic understanding of a trigger, but this is where things can get a little bit squirrely. I mentioned the different terminology and how people use it. A trigger, again, means different things to different people. So let's get alignment on, on how we talk about it here in the FLIR Research and Science vertical. Let's talk about the two primary terms, sync and trigger, as they relate to functions of the camera. If you come from a test and measurement background, this is still very good information to know because while a trigger is something that's easy to understand, it typically conveys, uh, the meaning of sync could be slightly different than what you're used to. With uh, FLIR cameras, sync is gonna be the pulse that tells the camera to generate an individual frame of data. Uh, another way to say this is that the sync pulse tells the camera to take a snapshot, take an image. Uh, you could send the signal to one camera, to multiple cameras, or you could have cameras set up in a master-slave configuration in order to capture the specific images needed for your you know, explicit application. A trigger, on the other hand, this is what tells the camera or multiple cameras to initiate the recording of a sequence of individual frames. The other way to say this, and more commonly, would be that the trigger tells the camera to record a movie. With respect to sync, a camera can be set to accept the sync pulse from an internal or an external source, uh, for example, if you had an application where timing had to be exact in order to capture a unique or fugitive event, uh, you'd pay very close attention to the timing of the externally applied sync pulse to coincide with the event. So if something was flying across the screen, uh, a, a missile, a bullet, you know, some event was occurring, uh, you'd need to make sure that that timing was set up appropriately to snap that single frame. Um, alternatively, if you had an event where timing of an exact frame capture wasn't really necessary, you'd likely just let the frames generate based on the internal clock source. Uh, with respect to triggering, the camera can be set to run without a trigger for users that don't require it, or it can be set to accept triggers from internal or external sources uh, from a specific timestamp on the camera's relative cl time clock, uh, or the source can also come from the software. We'll address the differences between software triggering and hardware triggering a little bit later, but you should note that in our bolometer-based systems, this is going to be the most likely form of triggering to take place. Uh, we call this tagging, and it's effectively where a signal is sent to the camera, which in turn changes the state of the trigger field found in the header of that frame file. Now, with the software configured to record based on that tagging condition, the recording begins when that frame shows up in the software and is read by the software, it sees that the field condition and the header field has changed uh, and begins that recording. So similarly on our cool, uh, our cryocooled uh, cameras actually have a similar uh, capability where we've got an optional method of initiating a recording like this. Uh, we typically call this record start uh, and record start leverages a switch closure action to initiate the recording. But uh, either way it's, 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 it's software triggering is effectively what we're doing there. Yeah, I mentioned the terms, I think, rising edge and falling edge on a previous slide and uh, regarding triggering, and you may not know what that means. So these are in reference to the electrical signal uh, with the rising edge going to be, you know, the measurement is going to be triggered when the voltage changes in the positive direction and exceeds the specified voltage and falling edge just being that the, you know, the falling trigger, the measurement is going to be triggered when the voltage changes in the negative direction and falls below a specified voltage. So to, to give you a real number here, for a five volt TTL signal, you may think that, oh, well, low is zero volts and, and high is five volts, but that's not realistic. Uh, the logic applied to these circuits is actually 
that low is typically you know zero to, to 0 0.8 volts and then high is two to five volts typically and so there's a there's a gap in the middle there where where you know there's a clear de deviation between what's going to be high and what's going to be low so you need a source that can provide those those voltages in order to, to use that as your trigger So getting into triggering and detector types. So does this, you know, apply differently? Does triggering and sync apply differently to de the detector types we just went over? Uh, I think so. Uh, otherwise, this wouldn't be much of a webinar topic. So we'll get into it. So just a brief review of uh, microbolometer basics. Uh, what you see here on the right is an electro uh, electron microscope, you know, view of the detector array. And on the bottom there is specifically a, uh, an individual detector element for a bolometer. Um, before we really get into this, you know, you might ask why options even exist, you know, since they appear to do the same thing, meaning bolometers, cryocooled systems, that kind of thing. I mean, you know, why would we have so many options when you're just converting some scene energy into a temperature reading? Isn't the problem solved? Well, to that I'd say yes, both bolometers and cryocooled options are designed to capture incident radiation, convert that to data values, typically temperature, but the way that they go about it is very different. And due to the approach, different capability requirements can be addressed. So here with microbolometers, also known as you know thermal detectors or power detectors, um, they're gonna read incident radiation as a change in the resistance across that detector element that you see there. Um, in that close up on the bottom right hand of the screen, if you're wondering, the pixel size here is 25 micron. So that's very large compared to some more common detector ele type elements like a CMOS where the pixels can be just a few microns in size. And that's so that we've got good surface area to, to capture that incident radiation and, and effectively read it with great sensitivity. So the detector consists of an array of these elements like you see in that top image there. Um, you know, with the bolometer resolutions, you know, ranging up to high definition, but typically being 640 to 480 or some smaller format in most cases uh, that addresses the majority of their use cases. Uh, the detectors, they're gonna be sensitive again from seven and a half to 14 microns. So these are long wave only. Uh, when looking at some target scene, again, that incident radiation, it's gonna be focused via a lens onto the pixel, causes that pixel element to be heated up, which changes its resistance. Uh, that change in resistance can be measured and calibrated to temperature values, which are then presented as an IR image of the scene. Uh, you can apply different false coloring to the values that you see. So sometimes you'll see it in, you know, white hot or black hot, or you'll see some, you know, varying color palette applied. And that's just false coloring applied to the values uh, that enable the best contrast to support your decision making. Or maybe you apply a color palette because you want to make the prettiest picture. Either way, the data underlying is the same. Uh, I mentioned that bolometers are typically responsive to seven and a half to, to 14 micron wave band. And there are a few reasons for this. One being that there's uh, an atmospheric transmission problem from about five and a half to seven and a half micron uh, that causes considerable degradation and attenuation to your signal. Um, at five and a half to seven and a half micron, there's a lot of water vapor in the atmosphere and water is highly absorptive in the infrared. So it's typically filtered out for most detectors. Uh, that's why you'll see mid wave going three to five and then you'll see a gap until about seven and a half or bolometers and other long wave detectors pick up. Uh, another reason that these are targeting seven and a half to 14 is that there are plenty of photons in the long wave IR uh, I mentioned earlier. Uh, bolometers, they're tuned to a peak sensitivity at about 10 micron, and that's due to Planck's curve peaking in energy at 10 micron for ambient temperature scenes so around 30 C. So what does that have to do with today's topic? Well, bolometers, like many design things, have to make performance trade-offs, and for them, sensitivity is going to be prioritized. Um, when, when talking about bolometers, where the design here you know, it's been optimized for sensitivity, but it's on a knife edge. So, you know, the design here, both speed and sensitivity are thermally, uh, well, speed and sensitivity are inversely proportional to the thermal resistance. Uh, so a sensitive bolometer inherently is, is a slower bolometer. So to repeat that a little bit, you know, bolometers are specifically tuned to be as sensitive as possible where the highest energy is available. And in doing so, they inherently limit the potential speeds and the way that they operate also changes the timing uh, capabilities on them. So you can see how this might affect time sensitive actions like triggering and syncing with other events or instrumentation. To give you a little visual here, you know, you can see that, you know, 
how the detector element, you know, resistance is is what's being read, and this is done line by line, moving down the detector uh, in a shift register. Um, from an imaging perspective, we call this a rolling shutter. Here you see it, you know, uh, the detector is actually that you see here is actually from a, a, a FLIR T1020 model, high definition handheld bolometer camera. And we used one of our cryo cooled SLS long wave uh, uh, cameras to actually capture the data since it can see through the same long wave IR friendly windows. And it gives us the ability to fine tune the integration time or exposure time for the best sensitivity in order to record this detector in action that you see going on here. Uh, in this video, you know, we confirm what we just talked about. Bolometers are being read out row by row. So it doesn't take a crazy, you know, demonstration to consider how that type of readout can cause problems for applications requiring tight control over timing or even the implementation of time-based capabilities like triggering and syncing inputs. Uh, by reading out row by row, the detector provides the time you know, required for the pixels to return to thermal equilibrium. And, you know, you might ask what the integration time actually is for a bolometer. You know, since we don't talk about bolometers it, with respect to integration time, we talk about cryo-cooled cameras the way because the user has access to that. With bolometer systems, the timing is pretty tightly controlled by the, the designer uh, specifically to optimize that. So you might say, you know, well, what would the integration time actually be? Uh, in order to consider evaluating it for a, uh, a speed requirement. And really the max integration time, you know, is, is dependent on the frame rate uh, and on the number of rows in the bolometer. So for example, 640 by 480 resolution detector, pretty common, uh, and a frame rate of 30 Hertz, also pretty common, is gonna provide an integration time effectively of about 70 microseconds. So that's just calculated by taking one over the number of rows over the frame rate. So one over 480 over 30, and that gets you, you know, 70 microseconds. Uh, unfortunately, since bolometers don't offer that, you know, control over the, the timing and integration to a user, uh, it's just how that, that works. So you're, you're pretty limited. Uh, another aspect of bolometers is, is the thermal time constant. Uh, please go back, watch the five things to know video on the topic of speed, because it dives deeper into this topic, but I'll just mention it here as it also plays into why these detectors aren't great for applications with more challenging timing and sync requirements. Uh, the detector, it's got a thermal time constant, effectively means that in order to capture accurate data, the target should be at a given temperature for roughly 60 milliseconds or greater, um, the exact time being very detector specific. Uh, this is roughly about five time constants. Uh, again, please watch that video on speed for more detail here, but even with this information, you can see that there are additional hurdles for bolometers and timing, not only the line by line readout, but also the inherent behavior of the detector material itself causes some limitations. So now on to cryo-cooled systems. Uh, before we get into the detector, I want to address what each of you might be thinking when it comes to a cryo-cooled system. On the left, we've got a classic pore-filled doer. Uh, that's controlled by use of liquid nitrogen, hence the pore filled name. Uh, on the right, we have an example of a closed cycle uh, Sterling cooler type camera. For the next few slides, for the rest of this really, we'll be talking about the closed cycle uh, detectors found in cameras like that shown on the right side of the screen. Um, this is mostly because camera systems like these tend to have much more robust electronics packages that enable access to advanced timing, triggering, and recording functionality, whereas the pore-filled doers are stellar for applications that require testing with a variety of detector components, but may be limited in their electronics package. So closed cycle is more on point for our topic today. Uh, here's what the, the parts of that uh, it can really look like. Um, it's what the inside of a closed cycle cryo cooler camera, specifically one that incorporates a linear cooler, look like. Uh, other DDCA designs, they're going to look different due to the use of a rotary cooler uh, that obviously isn't what you see here. Uh, moving left to right, uh, you see a small pipe leading from the cooling engine uh, up to a tube somewhat covered by the red bracket there. Uh, as you can see from the breakout images on the right, this tube is called the cold finger. It's what connects the detector uh, to the cooling system in order to bring it down to a typical 77 Kelvin uh, operating temperature. Uh, the FPA is where the, uh, or focal plane array, is where the incident IR energy is going to be captured uh, and converted into an electrical charge, eventually converted into a digital signal and resulting data imagery. 
Additionally, you see the cold stop there and the cold shield. Those are going to help to define the F number of the camera and so on. Uh, the actual detector is a combination of two components. The focal planary, like I mentioned, that's going to be made out of some unique material like Insby or Mercad, like I mentioned. Uh, the focal planar array and the, uh, the, the readout integrated circuit are the two parts. The readout integrated circuit is really the electronics back end of that focal planar array. Uh, this is why cool uh, detectors are called hybrid detectors. Effectively, they take the exotic focal plane array material, for example, indium antimonide or INSBI, and sandwich it with the ROIC, or the readout integrated circuit, via an array of indium bumps across that material. Uh, in order for the detector material to be useful to us, though, meaning that it's going to respond to excitation from inbound photons, the material has to be cooled down to about 77 Kelvin or so. Uh, it takes a closed cycle cooler about 10 minutes to, to get the material down to temperature. And in a cryo-cooled detector, if you're wondering about each pixel, we talked, we showed the elements earlier on the uh, bolometer system. Well, what do they look like here? Well, in a cryo-cooled detector, each pixel in the detector array is a unit cell with a unique integration capacitor, you know, per pixel per cell. Uh, so you can take a minute to imagine just a 1280 by 1024 array of integration capacitors, if that makes it a little bit easier to follow. Um, with a photon counter, the user again has the ability to set the integration time, which is a great proxy for exposure time in photography. Uh, when incident energy strikes that, that FPA or focal plane array, electrons again are kicked over to the integration capacitors, which in turn collect energy for the duration of the set integration time. So that gives the user very tight control over the quality of the image that can be captured, and more so very tight control over timing and frame rates for a given scene or image. Here's a simple animation to pull it all together. Uh, as the inbound photons from the target scene are captured by the integration capacitors, a calibration is going to apply an associated integration time, or maybe the user just sets an integration time, ideally for optimal well fill uh, to get the best imagery. Uh, integration completes, and the detector data is read out, digitizing the data, clearing the capacitors. Uh, and then the software takes that data, converts it to a temperature value, presenting all the data points from each pixel as an IR image. Uh, the design of the detector, it inherently provides a much faster response with tight control over timing, thus enabling very fast frame rates and short integration times. It also inherently provides a lot of hooks for timing-oriented capabilities, like a more deterministic triggering and syncing with other instrumentation. Since the cooled cameras have much more user-accessible timing and control, I'd like to dive a little bit deeper into that uh, as, as it relates to the topic here. Uh, in the cooled cameras, the frame generation is dependent on the sync process. Uh, earlier, we talked about sync being, you know, how frames are generated, right? So in the cooled cameras, the frame generation process, no different. It's dependent on that sync process. The two phases of the frame generation process are integration and data readout. So the integration phase and the data readout phase. Uh, like you just heard, the way that these detectors work is that they capture incident photons within the integration capacitor and the exposure time uh, or integration time that these capacitors are left, or the exposure time or the time that these are, are left open to capture the data is called the integration time. Uh, so I believe you see which phase here is the integration phase. Uh, once the integration time is complete, the next phase is going to be data readout. This is where we digitize the data and send it to memory on the camera or over to the connected machine. Um, not only do we already have control over the specific integration or exposure time and the subsequent, you know, possible frame rates that that can, can enable, but cryo-cooled cameras, they, they actually give the user the power to select which phase they would like the frame sync signal to use for frame generation. What this means is that you could either have the sync signal initiate the readout of the frame that was previously integrated, or you could have the sync signal initiate the integration of the next frame. Now, this is called frame sync starts integration for the serial process and frame sync starts readout uh, uh, for, the, for the overlapping um, or, or for the uh, frame sync starts integration for, for integrating first and then frame sync starts readout for, for starting with the readout there. Uh, you can even go a little bit lower than that um, and tell the controller, tell the camera, you know, if you want to integrate, uh, if you want the integrate to read process to be serial as shown here, or overlapping to increase the potential frame rates. Uh, this is called integrate then read for the serial process. Um, 
And this is great for maintaining data integrity and avoiding unnecessary drop frames. Uh, and then the overlapping process is what we call integrate while read, which is great for the fastest possible frame rates, though you may drop a couple. So it all depends on what exactly your, uh, your priority is there. So just taking a look at the back of these rear panels, you know, first off, these are not to scale. Uh, Velometer is typically very much smaller than uh, a cryo-cooled camera. For example, uh, if you can see my video here, I'm holding our new FLIR One Edge uh, Pro. It streams to your uh, to your phone here. It can clip onto it. You know, you can also see that there's not a whole lot of connectivity options. This is uh, a very entry level, you know, very portable unit here. Um, and then for scale, what I've got here is the X series camera, which you see the back panel of right there. So much, much larger in comparison. Um, what you have here as, as far as representing the bolometer here, if, you know, if, we, if we just take a quick look at the back panels of this fixed mount bolometer and, and cryo-cooled camera, um, the A400 on the right is, is the bolometer that we have present. These are the types that you'd expect to find in an automation application. Um, you can see that it's minimalistic on the back panel with industrial grade power, ethernet, you know, serial connections, even a Wi-Fi connection there. Uh, the serial connection is what's going to provide that I.O. for that tagging concept that we talked about earlier. And while timing challenges with bolometers can be a non-issue for many applications, there are many that require tighter control and more advanced capabilities. On the left-hand side, you see the camera that I was just holding up. It's the back of the, the X8581 uh, high-definition mid-wave camera. Uh, and it's very easy to see that there are quite a few connectivity options, but the highlighted box that you see there, um, that's where all of our trigger input and three sync connections exist. Uh, that's going to be a three volt TTL sync in, a sync out to do master slave or to send to another piece of equipment, uh, and a tri-level sync input as well. So just a lot of different options there that I think that the picture tells you a lot in terms of what's, what's option or what's, a, what's capable. So application considerations. I mean, really, the main application consideration here is going to be regarding timing, right? So specifically, what can your application tolerate? Can it tolerate software triggering? Uh, if you're not familiar with software versus hardware triggering, I, I always like to put it this way. Can your application wait for Windows to check the time in the middle of your command to record? It's a pretty simple question, but it tells a lot. Uh, basically, a hardware trigger is going to be much more deterministic because it's all occurring at the hardware level. A signal is sent, typically a three to five volt TTL directly to the camera or other test instrument, uh, and that's going to initiate the data capture. Whereas with a software trigger, the capture is really going to be induced by the software application itself, which if it's running on a non-real-time operating system, such as Windows or Mac OS, you know, they might need to do something. Uh, in the middle of you trying to get that command sent. And so it might only be, you know, a couple of milliseconds or, you know, a couple of microseconds, but that might be all it takes to throw your capture off. And, uh, and that, that, that's where that delay comes from. So if the application really can't tolerate potential delays inherent in software triggering, then a cryo-cooled camera is really what's going to be required. Uh, if software or no triggering accept is acceptable for the application, but high frame rates are required, then again, a, a cooled camera is really going to be what's needed. All in all, you know, selecting an, uh, an appropriate detector for your application is going to be dependent on that prioritized, you know, requirement that the other detector can't do. Does that make sense? So the easier the application, the less of those are going to exist and the wider the options when it comes to detectors. So. One final comment that I'm going to make here is that you can see how not having robust control over timing and sync could make captures like this impossible. Uh, and yes, on the right there, that's a, that's actually a mortar being fired. There's a very interesting story uh, where the the capture took place involving a Texas Fourth of July barbecue, uh, not terribly far from Texas A&M, if you know where that is. Uh, but we're out of time, so I won't be getting into that here. <laughs> so let's address some questions.